Hello? Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? OK, I want to just make sure everyone in the back can hear me as well. So hi. Welcome to today's talk uh, by me on designing AI prompts for content creation, balancing user needs with user experience. Um, so this presentation is mainly going to be about our experience as CK Editor and how we ended up creating these AI prompts uh, that are necessary for content creations and what we needed to achieve uh, the balance between user needs and UX. So I hope you find this session pretty inform uh, informative. So a little bit about me. Uh, hi, I'm a person <laughs> behind this podium. Uh, I'm a developer and marketer. Uh, I started off my career as a SWE at IBM Cloud Monitoring. Worked on full stack development there. And then I worked in developer marketing at DigitalOcean and then moved on to developer relations. Now it's CK Editor. Um, if none of that is interesting about me, I have a cute little dog. Her name is Nala, and I love to travel. I've traveled to over 30 plus countries, and most recently I traveled to Iceland, so there's a picture from my recent trip to Iceland. So, yep, just wanted to show the human behind this presentation before we get started. So, today's talk, what are we talking about? We're going to be talking about some of the six challenges that we ran into while building a generative AI assistant into CK Editor with an LLM like OpenAI. So if I refer to specifically LLMs uh, or API errors with OpenAI, 
then note that that can actually be generalized uh, across other LLMs as well. So I've made sure this talk applies to other APIs as well. And how we can overcome those challenges, like what are the lessons we learned and how did we overcome them? What this talk is not about is how great and cool AI is. I assume a lot of people in this room are already here because they know how great and cool AI is, or they're a little skeptical about it. And then what we're also not talking about is the technical ways to implement Gen AI into your application. If you do wanna kind of nerd out about that after the session, I would love to have a chat with you about how we did this technically um, at the booth, at the CK Editor booth uh, in the Expo Hall. So feel free to visit me after and I'm happy to nerd out about some of the technical ways. So yeah, here's a preview of uh, the AI Assistant within um, CK Editor. Okay, so let me get started. What is generative AI? So as any uh, person these days does, I went to ChatGPT and actually just asked it the same question. Said, explain generative AI to me in one sentence with an example. So then it said, hey, Gen AI produces new content by learning from existing data, like creating a new song after analyzing a collection of existing songs. The key thing that you need to take from this is that generative AI actually generates new content, hence generative, but it does this based on a large collection of existing data. So two key components, large collection of existing data and generating new content. Some of the popular generative AI tools are ChatGPT, Anthropix, Claude, Gemini from Google, and of course, Hugging Chat these days as well. Um, any other popular generative AI tools that you've heard of? I'm gonna make this session interactive and actually throw some questions back on you guys. So, any other ones that I missed? Feel free, this is an open session. <laughs> okay. <laughs> If not, there's there's several others. Um, like Ma Microsoft, of course, has like Azure AI for enterprises and things like that. Um, so when I say popular gener generative AI tools, these are things that apply to multiple use cases. These are large language models. But then there's, of course, specific use cases in terms of AI assistance, like Notion AI, Copy AI, Jasper AI, and so on and so forth. And of course, CK Editor's AI Assistant, which is very specific to the content creation. Yeah. Uh, any specific use cases that you are working on for generative AI in content creation? Wow, we have a very tough crowd today. <laughs> no one, uh, I see I'm in a room full of developers already, so yeah, I'm a developer myself. Call to action. Call to action. <laughs> okay, go for it. That's a great use case, video and media summarization. Oh yeah, go for it. Oh yes, that's that's huge in accessibility as well. Nice, thank you so much. So, well, why am I talking about this today, right? Why is AI important in terms of content creation? So if you haven't read this article and you're interested in content creation, I would Highly I recommend that folks reach out and read this article. It's called Experimental Evidence on the Productivity Effects of Gen AI. Um, and if there's anything you wanna take away from this article, um, I'll say there's one thing. They have s released a study that the average time of content creators, um, their productivity taken to like create a piece of content decreased by 40% and the output quality increased by 18%. That's huge. That means, imagine if you can, if your users at the end of the day are content creators, right? And if you can say that by using your AI assistant in your application, whatever the use case may be, whether it's all text or uh, for example, someone in the back sets video summarization and image summarization, then you are gonna be able to decrease their workflow of the time to produce something by 40% and increase their output quality by 18%. That is kind of like the magic numbers that you can reach in terms of your user's workflow. So that's pretty great. That is kind of the value add for your users at the end of the day. Again, highly recommend reading this article. Uh, gives you a lot of insights into um, how to improve productivity. So, who's Who's got generative AI already in their applications today? Just show of hands. <laughs> okay, very very few people. Who's who has it in their roadmap? Okay, a lot more people. 
right? Um, and when, when you have generative AI or when you're planning to put generative AI into your application, there's a few things to consider on where your users are, right? Um, and this is kind of a spectrum of where we found our users have are. We have, of course, the AI ninjas who don't need any explanation on how the AI assistant would work. You just give them an AI assistant, they know exactly how the prompts work and they type it in and they create magic. And then, of course, we have some of the folks who have fun with AI, but they really don't know how to get value out of it. They might be content creators, but they still don't know how to get value out of AI. And then we have some of the folks, your users, who must have heard of AI, but really don't trust it yet because they don't know what it's generating, and that's completely fair. And then we have a lot of folks who've never heard of AI, right? But you still want to cater to those users because they might end up using <laughs> the AI assistant more than your AI ninjas. So that's kind of the spectrum. So you're gonna see the spectrum, um, this kind of chart repeated in my presentation. So just be aware of that. And I've got some cool emojis just to keep the presentation a little bit fun. But yeah, so the ch six challenges, as I promised. Challenge number one. Thank goodness. <laughs> All right, challenge number one. Most people can't write good prompts. That is our biggest challenge that we discovered. And it's actually, it's not something we discovered on our own. We actually read an article around the time where we uh, were thinking about AI Assistant. That on the right is Jacob Nielsen of the Nielsen Norman Group. Um, they talk about usability, user experiences, they're a design group. And they re released a LinkedIn paper or post, and I've attached a link to the post in my slides. But the essential thing, the summary of that article again, is that 80% of native English speakers uh, can't write good prompts. Only 20% know how to write good prompts, which means most of your users who are gonna be using generative AI fit into this ballpark and most of them cannot write good prompts, right? And this is also the number one concern for developers when uh, we spoke with them as well. Is like, okay, we will give them an AI assistant, but how does this fit into their workflow? Why is this useful for them? Like, how can they make it useful? So, most people can't write good prompts. We have our AI ninjas and then those of uh, users who don't know much about AI. So we realized that some of these people would like more freedom with their AI assistant, more skills are needed, but they want more freedom. Those who don't know much about AI, they have lesser freedom, but they also need less skills um, to do this. So for the folks who are comfortable writing prompts, we said we'll give them an AI dialogue box. Just like your usual chat GPT, they can do what they want with it, uh, write in a prompt and spit out a piece of text. Um, we also have prompt history, which was an addition because we noticed that a lot of people like to go back to what they asked the AI assistant. Sometimes you forget, what was that prompt I wrote three minutes ago? I don't know, it had a few tweaks, but it worked really well for my use case. So that's that use case. Then the solution we came up with for the most people can't write good prompts was let's meet users where they're at, right? Let's give them the option of pre-engineered prompts that fit their use case. So what did we end up doing? We said, okay, what are some common phrases that people understand? What are some common phrases for content creation? So most common use case is if I'm editing or writing a piece of text, I'm gonna say I want to improve my writing, I wanna make it shorter, make it longer, add more detail to it, or simplify language. And of course we have a lot more pre-engineered prompts but this just, of course, behind the scenes, and I'm gonna dive into this a little bit more, but behind the scenes, there's a lot more to this prompt. But to your user who has no idea about how to get started with AI, this pre-engineered prompt is a very quick and efficient way to help them do so. And that's, that's where this solution came in, is really to meet our users where they're at whether they're at this end of the spectrum or that end of the spectrum or somewhere in between and they wanna use a combination of both. So, what do I mean by pre-engineered prompts? That means this. So I have something called improved writing. That's what my user sees. 
But behind the scenes, what I'm actually asking ChatGPT or Bing or um, Gemini to do is essentially saying, hey, fix the spelling mistakes, use proper grammar, and apply good writing practices. Don't lose the original meaning. You must keep the text formatting. All of that makes improved writing. So as you can see, behind the scenes, there's a lot going on for the prompt. But to your users, to those users who have not used AI before, or generative AI, they're not going to know how to write all of those five sentences to talk about improved writing. They just know they want to improve their writing. And this will help them do that. So that's kind of one example of what we do. The second example is clarify sentence that we had up. Any ideas on what the prompt could look like for that? This talk was on designing good prompts. Yeah, go for it. Okay, rewrite the sentence to make it more meaningful. That's a great start. Does anyone want to add on to that? What it could look like? This is hard. <laughs> okay, rewrite the sentence to make it more meaningful and understandable. Go for it. Okay. Rewrite the sentence to make it more meaningful, understandable, and remove unnecessary words. Okay, those are three things. Wait, sorry, what? Make it plain language. Okay, that's a lot, and I'm, I think I'm going to stop there <laughs> because I'm going to forget what we said. So rewrite the sentence to make it more meaningful, understandable, and remove unnecessary words and make it plain language. So with several rounds of brainstorming, we landed add something a little simple, but it says the text seemed complex or ambiguous, so we're telling it how the text seems, clarify it while retaining its original meaning. So that's kind of the prompt we landed at, but the suggestions we just workshopped, you can see how everyone has a different interpretation of what clarify sentence is, and we need to find kind of this middle ground when engineering these prompts. Um, let's try another one just to get more people involved in this. Uh, formalized language, any ideas on what formalized language could look like? Maybe remove slangs. Target audience, who is the target audience? Specific target audience? Yes, specific to the target audience. Yeah. Remove slang and and specific specify it for the target audience while targeting a certain reading level. While targeting a certain reading level. Okay. That's what we workshopped here together. Uh, what we came up with um, after several iterations of prompt uh, engineering is the text appears to be written in an informal style. Please write it in a formal tone. And notice we are being very nice to um, the <laughs> open AI by saying, please write it. Because we realized the tone, um, something when I was talking to the product manager um, about you know what are things that went right and wrong, it's also the tone in which you write to the AI assistant is sometimes the tone in which it responds. <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting thing that they found. So um, just wanted to share that slight thought. Awesome. So yeah, so we solved step number one, which is come up with these pre-engineered prompts. Because as you can see, within just a room of, um, let's say, 50 of us, um, we came up with very different interpretations. And you can only imagine if we take those interpretations and start putting them into an AI assistant, how different the responses will be. So to make sure your responses are consistent across your users, it's extremely important to have these sort of pre-written prompts, uh, not only to you know, add a level of trust with your AI assistant, but also to ensure consistent responses. Okay, challenge number two. 
responses are wildly unpredictable. Um, as I said, if you change the prompt ever so slightly, responses can be unpredictable. So this was early on in the CK Editor's AI Assistant when they were testing it. And I, uh, being me, tried to break it a little bit. And what I did was I said, OK, first, write about benefits of exercise for people who are non-native English speakers. And then, it, boom, it gave a very sweet, nice blog on the right. And then I took the same prompt and changed it up a little. Instead of starting with the word right, I said, using a language understood by non-native English speakers, write about the benefits of exercise. And then it gave me something like, exercise is a language lesson for your body. The more you practice, the better you get. And that is ex not exactly <laughs> what I was looking for. So as I said, responses, highly unpredictable. And this is not something you, know, you want from the AI assistant. So what do you do? Well, you do something similar to what we just did in the previous uh, round. The solution is to test and refine on an ongoing basis. Um, of course, make sure you're looking at your usage logs to uh, avoid any kind of high usages. But yeah, so this is kind of a prompt writing cycle based on, writing life cycle based on uh, some of my conversations with the PM. And what they do is they first start to write a prompt. Um, they write an initial set of prompts. And some of these are already available online, right? Today, prompt engineering is super popular. Go grab something that's already existing. Then you need to test it across a variety of use cases that are very specific to your users. Uh, because for every use case, there is going to be a slightly different response. And maybe you're working for a legal firm, or maybe you're working in healthcare, and maybe the tone, the language, the syntax needs to be different. So you really do need to test it across a wide variety of use case. Or even uh, with my previous example, test it with the same use case, just change the prompt slightly. And you know, if you're not getting the same sort of results, then choose the result you want out of uh, your prompt. The third step is to refine. You have to refine prompts based on test results and user feedback. So once you're done testing, you have to start changing that prompt, right? We just had a little bit of a feedback session, but I'm sure if I started typing that into my AI assistant and I got some wild responses, I'll go back and we can workshop it again and again and again until we reach a point where we're satisfied with that prompt and it gives us consistent um, responses. And then finally, you need to iterate on this entire cycle because um, you know it's going to be widely different from GPT 3.5 to GPT 4 to next up is GPT 5, I believe. So just based on the model, based on the responses, it's going to be widely different. So um, at CK Editor, we uh, actually offer API connectors into OpenAI, AWS Bedrock, Azure AI. And I'm not just name dropping, by the way. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying this because you do need to test these prompts across different LLMs to make sure you're getting similar outputs. So make sure you're doing that as well. OK, let's move on to challenge number three. Um, I can see some eyes glazing over. Uh, <laughs> so response formatting is inconsistent. Has, has anyone played around with uh, OpenAI's assistant and gotten some wild formatting? Responses? Got one, two, really only two people? Wow, okay. <laughs> Maybe I use OpenAI way too much. <laughs> um, so response formatting is inconsistent. Let me show you an example of what I got. So I actually wrote the same prompt. Write a, write a blog about dogs. I have a dog, I love dogs, so I wrote that. And the first response was a beautiful response, which was formatted. There was a title, um, an introductory paragraph. Great start. And then you, I hit, you know, I closed the AI assistant box, reopened it. I typed the same thing. The second response was the loyalty, playfulness, and unconditional love of dogs make them a beloved companion. It started in the middle of a sentence. It was not, you know, writing a blog about dogs. It just started in the middle of a paragraph and started writing, which is great. But that's not what I wanted. Um, so that is just one example of how response formatting can be inconsistent. Oh, go for it. In the browser, it's still in the same session, but when it comes to this API call, 
um, we have this trigam capability, right, where you can wait, like in the back, back end, you've sent out a promise, you've received a API request, and then you're waiting. So that's what that try again capability is doing. Um, there is a capability built into OpenAI's API, where you or most most AI assistance API. And correct me if I'm wrong, um, where you are waiting on the response. So yes, if you close it and open it in the API world, yes, it opens up a new session, but you're still in the same browser session. Just to just to not confuse people on the two session words. Yeah, um, yeah. So just just simulating like two different users using it. Yeah. Uh, so if you play around with this, which uh, in Drupal or in CK, so insert is gonna insert it exactly where my s cursor is at the moment of where this AI assistant has popped open. Insert below will insert it on the next um, space of where, uh, not where the cursor is, but the space below the cursor, um, yeah. And then try again and stop. We've all seen that with ChatGPT, yeah. At the moment, that I believe is not a feature here. But if you go to the CK editor roadmap for the AI assistant, which is in the documentation, I believe I, s I remember seeing that as one of the future things, like including we want image generation because images are a big part of rich text editors and things like that. So great point, great feature request. Um, I would go and upvote that if you do want to see that in CK editor. Uh, yep. Any other? Awesome. So yeah, so response formatting is inconsistent. So what do we do? The solution is to write uh, what I call like a prompt before the instruction. So what we started calling, you know, we just generated a prompt together and workshopped it. We start, we call that instruction internally. And then we generate a prompt that applies across all of our API calls. So no matter what API call goes out of CK editor, um, this sort of pre-prompt, uh, sits in that API call and that basically says your task is to execute the instruction using pr the provided HTML content um, and follow the instruction closely. Your answer must be a properly formatted HTML code. This is because the content within CK for our users is HTML code. Depending on who your users are and what your needs are, you would change that, of course. And then we said, hey, don't add any additional remarks or notes, and don't act like a chatbot or a real person, right? Follow the instructions closely. And surprisingly, that made the difference for making the write a blog about dogs consistent across, um, across prompts. So. Yeah, it's as simple as adding a new set of instructions so your AI assistant knows uh, what to do and what not to do. Any questions on that, on why we added that? Yeah. Oh, th yeah. Oh, yes. So the formalized tone is part of our pre-written prompts. So like improve writing, simplify language, we also have like formalized language as another preset option. That is different from this, which applies to all of our, pre all of our prompts. If it's pre-written or if it's a custom dialogue, right? If the user is entering in their own prompt or using one of our pre-written prompts, uh, the API call will always include this snippet to make sure that the formatting is the same across all responses. Yes. Awesome. Sweet. So that was our solution for that challenge. Now let's move on to challenge number four. Errors don't make sense to users. Which, fair. If you show an API error to a user, um, especially like imagine a writer or an artist who's just they just want to create content. They don't really want to know what token failed or how many tokens they have left. Well, 
that's kind of what happened, right? Initially, we had something like pop up, which was saying, hey, here's the, uh, there's an incorrect API key, 3A star 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 star, <laughs> you can find your API key at platform.openai, like that doesn't help your users. Um, so definitely make sure you're error handling your AI assistance. It's a very common mistake. Um, you think that plugging and chugging the API to the success route is good enough, but I think handling errors is equally important because that's part of the user experience, right? Um, and there's another kind of very common error that people forget to handle, which is the tokens. It's like, well, you're adding all of this context to your API and you know they might hit a token limit of uh, 4097 is the maximum token limit, but then we sent in 9487 tokens. You know, off the top of my head, even I don't know what that means. <laughs> I have to go look up the API docs. So um, the fix for that is contextualize them for your users so they really understand what tokens are or what an API key is, or just simply say, as we kind of do it, which is we've encountered an error with the AI engine. Our team has been notified, so plug in some functionality so you know that an error has happened. Uh, try again or contact our support team, right? Uh, contextualize this so that your users are not stuck being like, oh, I never entered an API key. Like, what are they talking about? Or, oh, I don't know how many, what tokens translate to. They understand words. So try just saying, try shortening it under 1500 words. Just makes it a lot easier in terms of user experience. Any questions on that? Actually, any com other errors that you've had to handle when using generative AI? Oh, yes. <laughs> so what was your solution for that? Nice. <laughs> nice. I mean, but that's important, right? That's important rather than just saying error, we don't work, right? There's a difference between try again in three minutes and error doesn't work. That's a great example. That's, that's a great point. And if you wanna experiment with that, um, you can actually just do it on ChatGPT is what I uh, learned recently from a friend. Just try entering the prompt uh, back to back about if you have your own ChatGPT Plus account um, for about 20 or 30 times within the span of five minutes, you will hit rate limiting. <laughs> so if you just wanna see how that looks for you on your end. They also have a great error handling system. So um, if you wanna take some inspiration from that, highly encourage that as well. Awesome, challenge number five. There is no standardized UI for AI. Um, I'm sure everyone here or who wants to put AI in their application or who's thinking about it or who already has it has probably tried to reinvent the wheel because there's really no standard UI for AI. And I'm gonna show you some examples that I have come across, right? The first one, even Google. You Google search these days, you get this generative AI uh, is an experimental and it just kind of pops up. It's part of your workflow, but it's not a standardized UI. That's not how every AI assistant looks. Like you saw, just you just saw CK Editor. It looks a little different. Um, if you're a developer, Visual Studio Code, GitHub Copilot. Um, I just stole this screenshot from Martin Woodward, who's the DevRel uh, person there. He had a great screenshot, so I stole that. And for example, you select that piece of code and say, hey, fine, this code is pretty buggy, tell me where the bugs are. That's a very different experience from the Google search experience that I had. Another experience, Canva. Um, it's very interesting. So I, you, know, you took a piece of image, you have a purple pot, and you said, I don't want the pot there anymore. I sh I'll color over that with a marker. And then I say, I want purple flowers. That's a very different experience from what developers face and what a general audience on Google faces. And then Jasper, you actually chat. 
you, if anyone has used Jasper Chat, you actually have this conversation with Jasper, and then it outputs a piece of text. So again, very different sets of UI. So um, another small example with Go, but yeah, you get the point. The point is very different experiences, no standardized UI. Where do I start with the design? Well, go back to the drawing board, right? The uh, you can take inspiration from everywhere. But the solution we recommend is don't just add it to your sidebar of your app. It's not going to be useful. You need to understand your user's workflow. And some of these successful apps that you saw, they built it into their user's workflow rather than bolting it on. And that's really important because if you want to add value to your user experience and to your users, you need to understand how their workflow is, whether, you know, if I'm using a search engine, well, I'm typing and then looking for an answer. So it's not really valuable for me to have pre-engineered prompts. But if I'm editing content on a rich text editor, then, well, it's really important to have some pre-written prompts, have an AI assistant I within my workflow. Um, in fact, for us, we have like part of the inline editor, you can put the AI assistant. So it kind of travels with you and your cursor as you're moving around. So it really depends on what your user's workflow is and you know, make sure you're not just throwing it on there for having an AI assistant. That's how you're gonna add value. And challenge number six, I, I know I'm getting more generic, but <laughs> hey, that's, <laughs> that's the deal here, but everyone's doing it and it's hard to stand out. Um, in, I saw this statistic somewhere and I'm gonna, when I say everyone's doing it, I think I mean everyone's doing it. If you go to, I think it said like 80% or 70% of websites today have some sort of AI assistant or some sort of AI within their product and it's only going to increase and the prediction is almost 98% of websites are gonna have some sort of AI in them, which means everyone is doing it. That is a fact. Um, now, how do you stand out? Well, the solution is, again, go back to the drawing board. It really doesn't matter that everyone is doing it. It matters whether your users actually need it. And the solution, think about how you can va add value to your users rather than just a checkbox feature. Because at the end of the day, if your users, if you're making your users' lives easier by decreasing, we're gonna go back to that um, statistic from the science, um, doc like science article which said uh, if you can decrease the amount of time they spend creating content by 40% and increase their quality of content by 18%, that is a huge value add. That's how you're gonna stand out from everyone else. And it is really hard to do, but this, the fact that you're trying to build it into your application rather than just kind of ride onto the craze, um, that's what is going to yield in long-term business benefits and, you know, at the end of the day, most of us are thinking about how to kind of uh, help the business. And will the AI craze ever die down? I don't know. What are your thoughts? I'm actually curious. I'm really hoping that AI becomes more like spell check, where it's in all the right places that you need, and it does what you want it to do without going crazy. Intuitive AI. That's almost AGI, but that's a different conversation or a different day. <laughs> Any other? Yeah. yeah. I, ideally, <laughs> ideally, you don't want it to stand out. You want it to be invisible to be part of the organic process. If you bring too much attention to it, people are gonna treat it differently. That's, that's a great point. Um, if you think about it, AI has been in our vision since before some of us in this room were even born. And even though we have all of these movies that say, hey, leave AI alone, <laughs> we still persist toward um, growing that technology and using it, and it will only continue to grow at this point. We haven't stopped, so more than likely, it's time to just jump into it because we're not stopping. All right. Those are great points. Hopefully AI is within your workflow and all of that. Um, one more, actually, all the way over the end. We have one more. 
Promison. Of the um, AI assistants that are that you're working with or integrating, are any of them using any transfer learning techniques to mine the data that is in the site and to see what other people have written in order to um, get familiar with the language and have a bit more tailored response? So our AI assistant, I'll speak to what we do. Um, I think that is, it is a possibility based on how you set up your LLMs, right? And how you have your API connector set up. Um, I'm completely talking about like the public LLMs that are not just hosted on your own platform and that you are not providing any data to train on. We at CK Editor do not own any data for any of our customers. It's up to our developers and customers to do that at the end of the day. Um, and if they decide that they're gonna have some sort of on-prem solution or something, something of that sort um, to have you know, to train on their own data sets and if their customers are giving them access to their data, there's there's layers in this, right? Um, you're asking customers for data, you're asking them for writing. So that's possible, but again, that uh, introduces a whole nother level of personal data. I don't know what the writing is used for. Maybe if it's like within a publication and they're all employees of this publication and they're using a editor, I can totally see them having their own LLM and having their own context and embeddings to train that on. So it is possible, we don't do that uh, at the moment because we are a rich text editor solution and we don't own anyone's data. Awesome. So a quick recap of the challenges that we faced and lessons we learned because I felt like I spent a lot of time under different things. So if you just wanted a quick recap slide, uh, the first challenge was most people can't write good prompts, responses are widely unpredictable. Response formatting is inconsistent. Errors don't make sense to users. There's no standardized UI for AI. And everything, everyone's doing it, it's, and it's hard to stand out. So lessons learned. Well, for that, we said, hey, meet users where they're at. Pre-written prompts are the way to go. For responses are wildly unpredictable, we said, let's test and refine on an ongoing basis. That will really help your prompts. Um, for resp response formatting being inconsistent, you need to specify your output format in um, detail. And then if errors don't make sense, contextualize the errors for your users so they make sense. If there's no standardized UI, learn to plug it into your user's workflow. Someone here mentioned it should not be something that stands out. Ideally, it should be something that they mindlessly uh, integrate. And finally, everyone's doing it. It's hard to stand out. Well add value to your user experience, right? Your users at the end of the day need to gain value out of this. Um, and yeah, so finally, I think we already discussed a little bit, but anyone else wants to share, share what challenges they've run into while adding Gen AI to their application or challenges they're currently facing? Yeah, go for it. Uh, so, so one of the challenges I'd say I, I've had is uh, it, it kind of goes back to the consistency or, or the inconsistency, cons inconsistencies in output where, um, you know, you get one, you know, first response is like, all right, I'm on the right path, and you, you double check it, and you're like, that's a little different. Uh, I started asking it for a confidence score uh, on a scale of 0 to 100, and um, Normally, I feel like when it's confident, it'll give me a 95. Mm -hmm. When things are going, you know, uh, when things aren't going well, it'll say like 70 or 50 percent. Okay. Let you dive in deeper. But um, do you have any suggestions on how to how to ask better prompts in order to, for it to be more confident? <laughs> how to ask better prompts for it to be more confident? Um, so we haven't faced an issue with like confidence or factual things, but something that I've seen. Um, with Stack Overflow's AI, if anyone has used the beta version yet, has anyone used Stack Overflow AI? Highly recommend it. They, I don't know if they're still in beta. I added it in August after the release um, onto my account. So basically how Stack Overflow does it is their confidence metric is we have this database of questions. We're gonna use generative AI to have a response based on the questions and then we're gonna cite our sources. Um, that I think adds a degree. So if you have an existing, I'm guessing there's some sort of facts-based driven, uh, and if you're 
testing on that data set, then maybe there's places where you can point back to the sources. So even if you're not confident on your sources, at least there's things related um, to that response that you can point your users to. I think that kind of adds a degree of uh, confidence. Yeah, I don't know if I answered your question completely, but there's ways in which you can, of course, uh, control the parameters for randomness, things like that. Of course, make it very, very much not less random if you don't want it to be creative. In our industry, in content creation and rich text editing, we want a little bit of randomness, so we encourage like a 0.7 for that uh, creativity factor. But of course, if you have an industry like, let's say, healthcare or legal, um, which we do have customers who have that, then we encourage them to kind of reduce that and provide more context or have em custom embeddings and things like that. And well, I can move on to Q and A. Any other questions? Oh, the last? I, this was answering that last uh, slide. Okay. That you had. Uh, the challenge that we've experienced is more on the people side, um, more people policy, mm -hmm. because the questions always arise uh, regarding where this data is housed, um, which, wh who are we giving access to our data to? And so tracking down that to answer those questions usually prevents adding generative AI into the app because you're trying to deal with policy at that point. Yeah, no, that is a great point. And ways in which I've seen enterprise do it is just host. Um, so of course there's enterprise gen AI, which I think someone over here said they were using. Yeah, Azure AI, right? And I think you can host it on your own. You don't on your own instance. So that might be a way to know exactly where you have your AI and be able to do that, especially if you're an enterprise. So thank you for helping me out there. <laughs> yes. This might already be in your documentation or something. Uh, this is the first I've heard of CK Editor and AI, so no idea. I apologize for that. Um, are you planning on anything that would let people integrate with something like Llama or other local AI solutions as opposed to just the more expensive options? No, that's a great question. So CK Editor, to answer the question, um, how many of you here use Drupal 9 or 7 onwards? Okay, so the default editor in Drupal, especially Drupal 10, is CK Editor. We've been the default editor for Drupal for 12 years. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but I believe 12 years. So you've most likely come across this rich text editor that you've typed a piece of text in. That's just CK Editor. It's part of Drupal core. Um, and then in terms of your question with uh, the AI connecting to uh, custom LLMs, our API connector, we have the documentation for connecting with, of course, these enterprise LLMs because most of our customers, the bread and butter of the company, are these enterprise com uh, customers. But the same API connector, it has the same functionality, right? All APIs plug in very similarly. So we do have the capability for you to plug into like um, some LLM in hugging phase or things like that. So um, it's exactly the very similar steps. Unfortunately, we don't have the bandwidth to update our documentation to support every single type of LLM out there. But we do have documentation for the, I would say the big four today uh, for enterprise customers and we might have a little bit more for open source, but great question. You mentioned a number of uh, upfront costs uh, for starting up, setting up, there's you know configuration, dev work, training people to become better, uh, <laughs> you know, the learning curve they have to go to, and also the, there's ongoing costs of continuing to keep it up to date, to iterate on your prompts and so forth, and as the technology changes. Is there any sort of benchmarks that have been developed regarding the size, the user base that you need to really make that make sense economically? Great question. <laughs> um, at the moment, we are still very experimental. We released the AI Assistant, I want to say like July or August. It's, we've not even hit one year on our AI Assistant. It's very new, right? Um, so no, we don't have 
great benchmarks on like these huge user groups because we still have our users adapting. Um, a lot of our users are still a little skeptical. You know, their questions are, where is this hosted? Will this be valuable for my users? So still a lot of studies that need to come up. Um, I believe there's a, but we did see one of our users uh, showcase our AI assistant about two, three weeks ago uh, on their like shareholders webinar that they published on YouTube. So um, it's, it's a wide range. Um, at the end of the day, we don't have benchmarks at the moment. We're not a SaaS company per se, so we can't also um, log. And we're a JavaScript component, right? CK Editor is a JavaScript component that kind of fits into your web application, so you can't really track the metrics on like who's using AI Assistant, what are they using it for, and we also don't collect that data. Um, we do customer case studies, we do a lot of user studies, about 300 per year. That's mainly where we learn about how our users use it. Any other questions? Oh. So my understanding is you're positioning this as a tool for visitors to a website to enter questions and things. Could this also be used by content creators on the website? And if so, could it learn like a style guide for the organization? So, yes. Um, again, that I think is up to, so what we provide is an API wrapper and a UI wrapper to have the chat completions and things like that uh, show up nicely on the editor. In the back end, we give complete flexibility to our developers to decide how they want to set this up, whether it's an enterprise company on an enterprise and on their own instance, or whether they're pinging the public API. It's completely the developer's choice. We don't um, get involved in that. Yeah, well we don't, our users don't enter anything to our website. It's strictly our writers and editors. And that, that's who our target is. Yeah, and there is ways, there are several ways in which today, if you have a database and your writers and editors are on board for you to train an LLM with that database, then you can, De most definitely do that um, and then paying your own LLM uh, for responses mm -hmm. but we don't train on behalf of our enterprises we kind of help our enterprises get this AI assistant set up and uh, potentially for any kind of embeddings that you want to add on so it is possible um, it would be a development effort on their end So we do have WProof Reader or Editor. Um, so CK, if you're in Drupal, um, if you're using CK Editor, there, we actually launched the free plugin pack today. There's a CK Editor 5 plugin pack if you go to modules and search it up. That actually includes a WProof uh, Reader or Editor. It has a certain set of tokens, but you should be able to get uh, spelling and grammar check out of the box with that. So you don't need the AI assistant for that. Uh, that's part of the, f we actually launched that for free for the Drupal community today. My colleague did that about two hours ago who was taking pictures. <laughs> awesome, I think we're done here, but I'm, I'll be at the CK Editor booth if there's any questions. Thank you so much. Oh, also wait, can everyone wait uh, for a Twitter picture for me quickly? If you guys can gather up front, I'll post to you on our CK Editor Twitter. Thank you.